I thought about half the women I meet uh, eventually ask me what my star sign is. Uh, I used to take this as an opportunity to set them straight. I'd explain that uh, astrology is inconsistent with everything we know about the universe, and that uh, it's been tested many, many times and always shown to be false. Uh, but it didn't do me any good. Uh, they didn't thank me and change their minds. They got angry. Uh, in fact, many of them accused me of violating one of their rights, namely their right to hold their own opinions. Everybody seems to believe that they have this right. They don't just have opinions, but they're entitled to the opinions they have. And this has become a truism of modern democracy. But like most truisms of modern democracy, it's false. In fact, it's not just false, it's a dangerous idea. It's a pernicious idea. Because it creates what I call intellectual protectionism. Like economic protectionism, it stifles the free trade of ideas. And therefore, like economic protectionism, which slows economic progress, intellectual protectionism slows intellectual progress. Um, that's what I'm going to argue in the next 17 minutes. Um, mainly, the, the idea of stops. Now, there's really only one thing you need to know about rights to see why the idea that we have a right to our own opinions is nonsense. And that is that rights entail duties. They don't just entail them, they don't be defined by them. So, for example, take your right to life. Your right to life means that everybody else has a duty not to kill you. If the government seeking to create a right to life passed a law which did not impose on everybody else a duty not to kill you, they would have failed to establish that right. This isn't something accidentally associated the right is the right. Now, the right to life is totally disputed. Exactly what duty does it entail? Does it merely entail that people don't have to kill you? or does it entail that they have to provide with food and shelter and so on? We don't need to answer that. Now, the point is just that whatever duties it entails, that tells you what the right really is. So whenever anybody says, pronounces some new right, what you want to ask them to understand what they mean is, well, what duties does this entail by other people? So for example, somebody, it's quite popular now to say that our right to be healthy is kind of a human right. That's quite hard to understand. Because we all die, which is quite unhealthy. <laughs> somebody's violated your rights, somebody's failed to do their duty when you die, that can't be. So they must mean something, they must have expressed themselves rather poorly, they must mean something else when people have a duty to provide you a place for medical care like So it helps to understand the right as you think about the duty. It also is a good test to see is there any such right. So for example, I want to an Australian politician say that every child has a right to be loved. Well, do I really have a duty to love every child? Uh, I don't even know them. Personally, <laughs> <laughs> there are two billion of them. Uh, maybe I have a, do I have a duty even to love a single child? I mean, I, I don't know. Is love the kind of thing you have a duty to do? I, I think really all he meant was it would be nice if every child were loved. But from the fact that something's nice doesn't mean that other people have a duty to provide me. You nice know, by 10 million pounds, but you don't have a duty to provide, provide you with. Uh, so niceness is really irrelevant. Now, let's get back to the right to your opinion with this in mind. Before I get to it, I think there's another distinction we should draw in rights. So there are two kinds of rights for all these people. One are known as claims and limitings. A claim is a stronger kind of right. If you have a claim on something, then other people have a duty to provide you. So contracts create claims. I have an employment contract, if I turn up to work into my job, I have a claim on my salary. The contract between me and my employer created this conditional claim. Um, now, if your right to life is a claim, that means other people have a duty to provide you the means to life. And that, by the way, is how most human rights organizations now interpret the right to life. The right to life actually creates a duty on the part of the state, and thereby on the tax factors indirectly to provide you the means to live. It's not just a liberty. If it were a liberty, all it would mean is that your right to life means that people don't, mustn't kill you, but they don't have to keep you, they don't have to do anything else, they don't have to provide you the life. So that's a liberty. A liberty just means people mustn't interfere with you doing it. They, must, they don't have to provide you with it, but they mustn't stop you. Right? You're at liberty. Now, let's get the thing about your right to hold your opinions. It can't be a claim. You can't have a claim on some opinions that you've got to provide them with these beliefs. That doesn't really make sense for really. uh, I don't know what that would mean. There's so many beliefs that you have, some false, some true, you can get to find more of them, or none of them. It doesn't make sense. 
So if we have a right to our own opinions, it's almost certainly a liberty. Nobody, other people have a duty not to deprive you of your beliefs. And that's roughly the way the expression is used in morning conversation. And you may be sympathetic to this idea. You may think, well, surely nobody should force me to change my mind. I should be allowed to hold my beliefs without interference. That's a natural idea. Unfortunately, it's completely wrong. Because the only way to get beliefs or to change them <coughs> is by force. You can't choose what you believe. So I establish this for you now. Think of something you don't believe. For example, that you can fly. Um, I guess you all believe you can't fly. One not to <laughs> Let's just suppose. Now try to believe. I'll give you a moment. Come on, try to believe that you can fly. So you can't. <laughs> you might be able to say in your head, I can fly, but that isn't really believing. For example, none of you are going to jump out the window. So you can't just choose what you're going to believe. Beliefs are always forced on you. Belief, believing something isn't like dressing. You, don't just, you can't just pick the items of clothes that suit you, the beliefs that suit you. Believing is much more like getting fragments. Stand out the sun, and if you have skin like mine in a way, the fragments just happen. They're forced on. You can't help what you end up believing. So the way they're forced on you, by the way, is not by threats or what I call political change. People can threaten you. They can say if you don't believe, if you don't pronounce your belief in Jehovah and that Jesus was his son, I'm going to throw you to the lions. Now that might encourage you to say you don't believe, but it won't actually change your beliefs. If you do believe in the first place, the threat won't change your beliefs. It will just change what you say you believe. If I threaten to kill you if you don't believe that you can fly, you might say, oh, I can fly, I can fly. But it won't make you actually believe that you can fly. So you can't force people to believe things through threats and coercion. The way beliefs are forced on you is through your principle, uh, through your sense organs. So you just open your eyes and your ears and so on, and beliefs can flood in. So most of you probably now don't believe that I have a tattoo of Hillary Clinton on my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> but if I were to open my shirt, you would, you would not be able to help yourself. <laughs> I did, and I showed it to you, you would just end up believing that I had a tattoo of Hillary Clinton. You could probably you could choose not to believe it, having seen it. And that's, that's the main way beliefs are forced on us, through our sense organs. In fact, that's the whole point of your sense organs. You know, beliefs are supposed to correspond to reality, the outside world. So they shouldn't come from within. You should choose what they are, because you want them to correlate to the real world. So they should come from the outside, they should flood in, and they should be involuntary. And that indeed is how our perceptual mechanisms have evolved. And the same goes for argument and evidence and all that kind of thing. I can present you an argument and you'll make a case. And you'll find it convincing or you won't. You can't choose to be convinced by it or choose not to be convinced by it. It just happens. So when people seek protection for their beliefs, when they say I've got a right to my beliefs and you mustn't do anything to interfere with them, what they're seeking protection from is not political coercion, because you can't affect your beliefs in that way anyway. They're seeking protection from evidence and argument of a good case. So the right to your opinion is a defense against evidence, it's called. That's why you can't have both a right to hold your opinions and a right to express them. Because if you've got a right to hold your opinion, I mustn't say anything that might change your mind. If I say something that might change your mind, and I'm not doing my duty of letting you keep your beliefs. So you can't have freedom to express your beliefs and freedom to hold them. That's why this is intellectual protectionism. You're trying to protect certain beliefs by restricting the free trade of ideas. And, so, and, then, and indeed, that's how people use it. They get frustrated in an argument. They want you to shut up. They say, I've got a right to my opinion. <coughs> now, nobody believes this. Nobody takes this idea seriously in the case of what I'll call everyday beliefs. Ordinary beliefs, you know, butters on the table, there's a car coming. Take the car. You're on the street with a friend. You know your friend isn't suicidal. She takes a step into the street, and you can see there's a car. Now remember, she has a right to her opinion. 
you say. <laughs> I think you may be wrong in your assumption of her cargo. If you look up the guy on me, you change her mind. She'll, she'll probably thank you. She won't, she doesn't, nobody wants their right, their beliefs defended or protected from correction in, the, in cases like that. Uh, if I say, uh, did you notice that you have the winning lotto numbers? They probably won't complain that I forced this belief on them. Uh, you've got a crumb on your lip, stuff like that. People aren't too upset. It's for the special beliefs where they claim this protection. They claim to have a right. And the special beliefs are the, you know what they are. They're the ones associated with your identity. Your religious beliefs, beliefs about sexuality, broadly political beliefs, that kind of thing. All the kinds of things you're not supposed to discuss in polite society. That's when this right is invoked. You can nowadays probably, I don't know, maybe so it's different, but you can probably go through your entire life, even have a good education, and if you live in polite society, have none of your most stupid ideas challenged because people understand that there are these kind of conventions, not necessarily of law, partly of law, I'll get to that in a second, but mainly social conventions that limit people's uh, like, limit their freedom to have a crack at your beliefs. Uh, so I, in, the, in my company, in the American office in particular, if you were to have a very robust discussion and express certain opinions about sexuality, let's say, or some religious ideas, you'd probably get fired. I mean, you might not get fired, but you'd certainly get in trouble if you're told to shut up. Uh, it would get you in We'll get you in trouble. The president of Harvard University until recently, Larry Summers, who's now one of the Obama's economic advisors, he made a speech in which he said that the reason there aren't any top professors in women professors in physics and maths is that women's uh, distribution of IQs is different. That the, the tail, the most extreme stupidity and intelligence, tends to be men. So if you think of distribution, <laughs> men are the longer tails. And that's why most real idiots are men and most real geniuses are men. You said it's right. Now I'm not saying it's right or wrong. The evidence suggests that it's right. And that's what explains why most physics professors are men. He got fired. You're not allowed to say this. It doesn't matter if it's true or not, it's unsaid. When he made the speech, people must have thought, you idiot. How could you say this? They're not thinking he's an idiot. His ideas are here, but they he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand the conventions of modern American society. Just say that. So he lost his job. Now in Britain, we have speech rules. <coughs> so it's illegal in Britain. Well, it's strictly illegal to commit blasphemy, but it's also illegal to say things that are deemed um, inciting hatred against uh, religious groups or homosexuals. Uh, now, and Nick Griffin, I think, the head of the BNP, was prosecuting for this in the case of race. Now, like me, you probably don't like racist comments. You probably wish people wouldn't make them. But you ought to dislike laws prohibiting them. You ought to dislike intellectual protectionism even more than you dislike people making racist remarks. Because once this idea gets going, right, that the state, its proper role for the state, pick certain ideas and to protect them legally from, let's call them, robust engagement. Once that idea gets going, everybody's going to want protection for their pet ideas. And who's going to get it? Well, think about economic protections. Who wants economic protection? Companies that are inefficient want it. They're the ones who are going to lose out in the competition. So it's the inefficient companies that seek it, and who gets it? Well, the influential ones, the big ones. No corner store ever gets economic protection. It's the likes of Citibank and General Motors who get it. So oddly, the more wasteful a company is, the bigger it is. Inefficiency is just waste. So the bigger it is, the more waste it's engaged in, the more likely it is to be protected. So the policy of economic protection positively encourages waste. Intellectual protection is a similar who needs their ideas protected? Well, people who are very good at walking, right? 
they, they're not necessarily easy to protect. And who's going to get it? Well, the influential groups are going to get the protection. So just as economic protectionism promotes waste, intellectual protectionism will promote error. And the more widespread the error, the more likely you are to get protection. The obvious idea is, for a lot of people, so well, let's just protect the true ideas. Well, the problem is that the whole point of their uh, intellectual competition is we don't know in advance which ideas are true. Right? We, can't, we want the competition precisely to reveal that. And that's never how it works anyway. It's not the good businesses that get protected. It's the dodgy ones. The same with intellectual protections. The answer is not to protect the true ideas. The answer is to give up on this whole idea, to reject the common idea that we have a right to a country. Thank you.